So hey everyone, uh, I'm Faraz, and uh, I want to tell you today about WebTorrent, which is uh, my, my open source project to build a BitTorrent client that works in the browser. And um, this is kind of madness, because uh, BitTorrent is not something that has ever worked in the browser, um, and so the, 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 the project is definitely uh, in the mad science realm. Uh, and uh, it uses this awesome peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocol called WebRTC that uh, has recently landed in the browser to enable this. Uh, but before we get too much more into WebTorrent, I wanted to talk a little bit about how BitTorrent itself works. Because I think it's something that we all use every day. Uh, well, a lot of us do. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's, it's you know, something that for a long time I didn't really understand on a very deep level. I kind of knew you know, high level that you, know, you have these people out there that have the files that you want and you somehow connect to them and they send you little bits of it and then you kind of like put it all together on your machine and then you have the file that you want. But it's actually kind of cool to kind of look into how the protocol works. Um, and so I thought we would talk about that first. So traditionally, um, the way that most of the services that we use every day work is uh, the, the client server model. So you have like an HTTP server and you have a client that connects to it. It sends it a request asking for a specific resource. So in this case, file.txt. And if the server has it, it'll send back a response containing the file. And the way that we refer to all these files is using uh, something called a URL, or a, a uniform resource locator. And the URL tells you where to go to get the file. So it's all about the location of the file. So in this case, the file lives at example.com. And you know, it's our job to go and find that server and then to ask it for the file that we want. And so as more clients show up, you know, they continue to go to the same location and ask the same server for the file that they want. Eventually, you get to a situation where you know, the server needs to either upgrade to handle the number of requests that it's getting, or it's not going to be able to handle them all. Another issue that comes up with this model is if the server disappears, then we can no longer get the file because we're referring to it by its location. So if the location disappears, then the file is gone, and this is the jetted broken link that we all see on the web every day. Oftentimes, too, URLs will change. So the, the file is exactly the same, but somebody decided to name it something different or put it on a different server. And this is also undesirable. So in the BitTorrent model, we don't have a server at all. We just have clients. Everything is a client. So, so at some point, a file, you know, somebody needs to decide, I want to bring a file into the network. Um, so there's, there's still you know, an initial publisher, because there has to be. There has to be a person who says, hey, I want to you know, share this file with people. Um, but instead of putting it onto a server and then sharing a URL, what they do is they create a torrent file. And they become what's called the initial seeder. So a seeder is just somebody who is making a file available and sharing it. And they're the initial seeder because they're the first one doing that. So when clients come later on and want this file, they connect to the client and you know, they make a request and get back a response. And this is very similar to HTTP, except it uses a different, um, you know, different protocol. So we have a method, and then we have a piece index, a byte offset, and a length. And um, these are kind of similar to an HTTP range request, if you're familiar with that. Um, how many of you have actually used like, an HTTP range request before and know what it is? It's basically a way to say, hey, um, you know, I want this file, but I only want this byte range, um, so send me just this part of the file. And clients often have like, you know, good reasons for doing this. Like if you're watching a video, maybe you want to you know, download starting from halfway through the video or something like that. Um, and then there's also, you know, similarly, there's a response that comes back and it you know, just confirms the, uh, the piece of the file, the, the byte offset, and then the actual data comes last of all. And so in this model, as the number of clients increase, you'll notice that the number of connections increases much faster than the number of clients. So typically, a client will connect to more than one client. So in this particular example, 
it's not a fully connected graph, so every client isn't connected to every other client, but every client is connected to more than one client. And one of the things that comes out of this is that we get really fast downloads. Because the protocol is, first of all, it's a really efficient design. Um, so it's, it doesn't send very many bytes on the wire. And um, it can do things like use UDP and uh, other you know, non-TCP um, protocols to make uh, the, the um, you know, to utilize like the multiple connections very well. And the, be the, you know, the best part of all is that every downloader is also an uploader. So you know, even though I don't have the complete file, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing the bits that I do have with the rest of the network. Another benefit is it's decentralized. So there's no central point of failure. There's no place to go and, and you know, there's, no, there's no server you can go and shut down to censor the network. Because you literally have millions of nodes all across the world that might pop up for an hour in a Starbucks and go down. Um, you know, and they're just too many, too many places. Um, and so you know, it's, it's a really robust design. And it, it, it kind of reminds me of like, the early days of, of the internet. You know, it, it was designed to, to tolerate network failures and to be kind of really um, resistant against uh, attacks on certain infrastructure, you know, routes around it. Um, and so this is, this is kind of like that. So let's, let's talk about like a little bit more about how that works. So this, this peer here is the initial seeder. They have the full file. So what they do is they split the file up into pieces. In this case, this file that they're sharing has five pieces. We just label each piece. And there might be other peers in the network that are um, you know, downloading the same file. They might not have the full file yet. They might have only parts of it. And then we show up, and we don't have anything. And so what we need to do is we connect to these peers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we do that. But once we're connected to them, we need to uh, figure out what pieces they have. And so during the handshake process, uh, every peer actually tells us exactly what pieces they have. And throughout the duration of uh, the, you know, the life cycle of the protocol, um, the peers actually keep us up to date. So every time they get a new piece completed, they'll let us know. So we have a very accurate model of what pieces the people that we're connected to have. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll just send um, a request to, uh, to each peer and ask them for different pieces. So for, for peer one, you know, we can ask them for piece zero. For peer two, we can ask them for, for piece one. And uh, we, we'll get piece three from peer three. So this, this download will, uh, will start to happen. And uh, eventually, we'll have those pieces. And then our job is to you know, make additional requests to get the remaining pieces. And of course, during this time, the other peers are going to be uh, you know, completing their downloads as well. Um, and um, we'll eventually uh, get to a situation where uh, everything is, uh, well, we have all the pieces. But now we need to reassemble them, right? Because we got them, and they could come in in a random order. And so uh, we just you know, put them in the correct order, which is pretty straightforward. And now we have the full file. So a couple of other things we can do to make the, 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 the um, protocol more robust, and this is some, these are things that all existing BitTorrent clients do, is we can uh, follow a tit-for-tat model. So what this means is we help the peers that help us. So if there's a peer that is um, being kind of stingy, you know, we ask it for a piece, and it just decides to never reply to us. Um, we'll, we'll take note of that, and we will we'll be less likely in the future to uh, answer their requests. Um, and this is kind of like a, you know, a model where every, every client kind of has its own self-interest uh, at heart, and it helps those who help, help, help it. And one of the, the cool things that comes out of this, actually, is that um, you can kind of do a little game theory, and, uh, and, and, and uh, every client kind of tries to game the system to um, get the fastest download speed that it can get. And this actually helps the network uh, as, as a whole. So what I mean by this is um, every client's actually trying to download the rarest possible pieces that it can find. So let's say there's a piece that just for whatever reason is, you know, fewer people have it on average. If your client goes and gets that rare piece, then suddenly it's become a lot more desirable to the rest of the peers in the network. Because, you know, that piece is, is just not as available. So you're more likely to get connected to and, you know, you're more likely to get that piece requested. And so that means that that those peers that are connecting to you have an incentive to be nice to you and to trade with you. And, um, and that's, that's really cool. So also, if you look at the, you know, the whole network level, this is actually really good for preserving the health of torrents um, in the long term. So you know, as a torrent um, ages, there may be fewer cedars. Actually, at the beginning, too, when a torrent first gets put up, there's also very few cedars. And in both of these scenarios, there is a chance that if 
those cedars go offline and disconnect for whatever reason, that the torrent will become incompletable. So this means that even if all of the remaining peers in the network pool all their pieces and share amongst themselves, there might still be some piece that just disappeared and no one has it. Um, and that's, really bad, that's a really bad situation to be in. And so by downloading the rarest pieces, we decrease the likelihood that this you know, bad situation is ever going to happen. Uh, and lastly, we can preempt slow peers. So what that means is if a peer uh, is being really slow for whatever reason um, and taking forever to give us a piece that we requested, um, we might say, well, why are we waiting for this person? Let's request that same piece from an additional peer. And so we might be actually asking for the same data from multiple people at the same time if we deem that you know, this is a really important piece that we need to get. And this will come into play when, we're, when we actually do streaming, where we'll download a, a torrent sequentially in order to play it back in, in, a, in a video player, which is, which is really cool. So how do you refer to a torrent? So there's no URLs for torrents, right? There's no, um, you, know, you, don't, you don't refer to them by their location because the location is you know, millions potentially, you know, you know uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of, of peers around the world. So instead, you refer to a torrent by what it is. So you refer to it by its content, not by its location. So what I mean by that is um, we have these little things called torrent files. You've probably seen them before. They're a little file. And if you've ever, op if you've ever like, bothered to open them up in a text editor, you'll notice that there's a lot of data inside those files. And so the important stuff that's in there are the name and uh, a list of all of the pieces in the file. So the initial person who, who created this, file, this, this torrent, they, what they did is they split up the, the, the file into all of these little pieces. And then they hashed each piece using a cryptographic hash function. Um, in the case of BitTorrent, it's SHA-1. And they produce these little hashes. And they put them into the torrent file. And this means that you know, uh, once I have my hands on this torrent file, I can get data from anyone on the network. And I can verify that the pieces that they've sent me are what I was supposed to get. Because I already know, you know the hash of the content. And then the last bit is there's this uh, announce field, which tells you where to go to find peers. In this case, it's uh, a server tracker.example.com, which is a place where we can go and say, hey, tell me the peers that I should talk to to, to get this uh, content. Now, that's a point of centralization that's not ideal, and we'll talk about how we can get rid of that in a sec. But um, so one thing you might have realized is that, that this torrent file is not, really, is not really succinct, right? A URL is kind of nice. You can copy and paste it around and stuff. But with the torrent file, it's kind of this big, messy, blob of, of data. and um, So what, what people have done is there's a, there's a really succinct way to refer to a torrent. And what you do is you just hash the whole block of data up there. And you get what's called an info hash, which is just one hash that can re refer to the whole torrent. This is actually how magnet links work, if you've ever seen those. So um, real quick, let's just review like uh, cryptogra cryptographic hashes, because this is like how you know, we verify that we're getting the correct data. So I'm probably boring some of you, but um, this is it's basically a one-way function where you have an, uh, you, the same input always produces the same output. And given an output, it's really hard to find uh, what input produced it. So this means that when we're trying to download a file, if we ask a peer for a piece and we're expecting to get a happy face, um, you know, we know what the hash of that is. We know, what, what, we know when we hash the content that we're looking for it to be this particular hash. And if some malicious peer on the network decides to send us the wrong data, like a sad face, and they've changed it, manipulated it in some way, when we hash it, it's going to turn into something different. And we'll know, OK, I can, throw this, I can throw this away, and I'll mark this peer as untrustworthy and never talk to them again. And so the, um, the hash that we produced for the torrent file, that info hash thing, is used by a tracker server. And what the tracker server does is it keeps a mapping where the, the key is the info hash, and the value is an array of all of the peers that are interested in that torrent. So when I say interested, I mean uploaders and downloaders. So these are people who either have the complete file or are trying to get the, the file. And um, a client just tells the tracker, hey, I'm interested in this file. Please add me to your array of, of peers. And then next time someone comes along trying to download that file, the tracker will send them that array, and then they'll know who they should talk to. So like I mentioned, this is kind of you know, not ideal. It's a point of centralization. 
So let's talk, let's talk, you know, let's just compare it to HTTP and see kind of why, like, what, what is the difference between BitTorrent and HTTP? So um, with HTTP, um, you know, you, you, you find URLs through central means. You know, you go to a search engine, you go to Google, or your friends email you a link. There's no kind of way to kind of discover links. You just, you just have to trust someone to give you the link. Same thing with torrents. You know, you, you go to a search engine, your friend emails you a torrent file, something like that. And then when it comes to finding peers, well, in the case of HTTP, it's not really a peer. You're trying to just find the IP address of the server. We use the domain name system. Um, and that is distributed, but not decentralized. So domain name system, domain name system you know, it, it's many servers working together, but it's, it's still um, not, uh, you know, it's not robust against like censorship and, and things like that. And in the case of uh, torrent files, again, we're going to a tracker server and asking it to tell us which peers we should talk to. Not ideal. However, we do get, you know, decentralized file transfer. So we're getting the data from many, many peers, and that's pretty awesome. But we can do better. This is where magnet links come in. So with magnet links, we use something called a distributed hash table to find peers. So we can actually eliminate the tracker server. So with magnet links, we can actually go from just having the info hash, so this little 160-bit string, we can go from that to having the full file without really ever talking to a server. Um, and that's really, really cool. So what is a DHT? So I think, a DH, I think DHTs are so cool, by the way. DHTs are like one of the coolest ideas in computer science. I, I, like when I first discovered what a DHT was, I was telling all my friends about it constantly and everyone was like, dude, you're a huge nerd, stop telling me about this. <laughs> I, I even actually, when I went in for a job interview, I, I, I got off track and started explaining what DHTs were to the interviewer and they, they were just like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> so they're really cool. Um, so they're basically just a distributed um, key value lookup. So you know, in, in JavaScript you have you know, objects and um, you, know, you, can, you can put uh, you can set properties on them, right? And then you can use it as a key value lookup. Well, a DHT is just that, except the storage is across millions of nodes all over the world. And you can, when you want to do a lookup, you actually have to go out and find those nodes and then tell them, you know, the key that you want to look up and then they'll give you back the value. What's cool about it is, you know, you can basically turn all of the peers in the BitTorrent network into mini tracker servers. So everyone is tracking certain subset of torrents. And they're, they're keeping that mapping of, of you know, torrent hash to array of peers. <coughs> it's also really, really efficient because it uses this, um, this uh, system called Kademlia, which is written about in a research paper, and it has provable performance characteristics um, that are really good. So it's like O of log n, where um, n is the number of, of peers, uh, in the number of nodes in the network. So let's talk about how it works, okay? It's really cool. Uh, I created a little visualization. Hopefully it, it does a good job of explaining it. Um, but uh, we'll see. Okay, so the way, we, the way I think about it is we have uh, a big number line, okay? And um, the, the number line goes from zero to two to the 1 60th power. And the reason why it's two to the 1 60 is because um, that's, uh, that's the space of possible um, you know, numbers that you get when you, when you SHA-1 something. So a SHA-1 hash is a 160-bit, is a uh, you know, has 160 bits of randomness. So when you, when you hash something, it will, it will um, you know, produce a hash that's somewhere on this number line, right? So when we, first, um, when we first boot up our torrent client, it chooses an ID for itself randomly. So in this case, um, let's say we boot up and our ID is somewhere you know, over here near 2 to the 30th. So we're somewhere on the number line. Cool. Now, throughout the course of the protocol, we're going to be introduced to various peers. Um, and as we discover these peers and talk to them, we add them to our table. So let's say we find a peer here, find a peer there. We, we keep adding them to this table. And basically what we're doing is saying, this is their, their ID. It falls here on the number line. And um, this is their IP address and their port. This is how I can talk to them. Now, obviously, we don't want to just add everyone that we talk to, because um, there are millions of nodes. There's actually like 10 or 20 million nodes in, um, the, in the BitTorrent network at any given time. And so we can't store all of these, and that's just a bad idea. So we need some way to decide what to store. So what we do is we create this, um, we have this notion of a bucket. 
Um, and every bucket has a maximum size. So when we start out, we just have one bucket. It's the whole number line. And let's just, for, for, for um, sake of uh, this demo, let's uh, say that um, our bucket size is four. But in practice, it's usually something like eight or 16. Um, and we don't want our bucket size to ever surpass k uh, or, or four. So when we get a new peer, and if adding them would make the bucket have k plus one uh, nodes in it, then what we're going to do is check and see, is our ID in the bucket? So are we in this bucket that we're about to add this peer to? And if the answer is yes, then we'll split the bucket in half, exactly in the middle. And then now we'll have two buckets. And then we'll add the peer that we just discovered to you know, where, whichever bucket they go into. But if we're not in the bucket, then what we're going to do is ping all the peers that are in that bucket, send them a ping message, and see if they respond. If one of them doesn't respond, that means that they've gone offline, then we're going to delete them from our table, and we're going to add the new peer. So this is cool because we end up keeping um, nodes in our table that are long running. So we'll never replace a good node that's online with a new node that we've just discovered. And then if, um, you know, if, if all the nodes are online and they're all good, they're all healthy, then we're just going to throw away this new peer. We're going to say, too bad, I'm not going to store it in the table. Just going to throw it away. So let's take a look at how that, how that would work. So we have our, our hash table here. And let's say we, um, we learn about a new peer. So this is the fifth peer. This would, you know, we don't count ourselves. So this would, there's four peers currently in the table. And now we discovered a fifth. That's k plus 1. That's too many. So now we need to decide, are we going to keep it? So we say, are we in this same bucket? And yes, we are, because there's only one bucket. And so we say, yes, we're going to keep the peer. We split the bucket into two, and we add the peer. Now, time goes on. We continue to discover new peers. Cool. Now, again, we get into a situation where we discovered another peer. Um, there we go, yeah. And now we need to decide, are we going to keep them again? And we ask ourselves the question, are we in the bucket? And this time, no, we are not in the bucket. This is the bucket that, that we're not in, because we're the star. So we're not going to keep this peer. We just throw it away. And so this continues. And this keeps continuing. And eventually, you get, you get into a situation where this is kind of how the table will look. Uh, I ran out of space. You know, this, in practice, would be very, very much bigger. Um, and you end, up, you end up noticing that the, the buckets get really small around your ID's location. Um, and, and, and since all the buckets contain the same number of nodes, you end up um, having like, a lot of information about the peers that are near your own ID. The table is really dense there. OK, cool. So now let's talk about what operations you can do with the DHT. So you, the, the whole point of this is that, that this is a key value store, right? So when a uh, peer connects to us, they can send us a put message that says, hey, please put this, this value at this key. And what we do is we look at the key and we say, um, is this key near our own ID? And the, the reason why we do this is that so remember I said, all the peers are, are, are acting as miniature tracker servers. Now, everyone is responsible for a certain uh, range of torrents. So if my ID is near 2 to the 30th, I'm only going to be responsible for tracking torrents that have IDs that are near my own ID. So I'm not responsible for storing keys and, keys and values for like any torrent, only the ones that are near my own ID. So if, when someone tries to put something, I will look at it and say, am I actually responsible for this? And if I am, I'll store the key value in my own table. And if I'm not, I'll just throw it away. And so this is what a put message in practice would look like. So this is some peer saying, hey, I'm interested in this torrent, this info hash here. And this is my, my contact information, my IP and my port. And I'll, I'll store that. And so the DHT storage looks exactly the same as tracker storage, except you'll notice that like in this example here, I'm storing, I'm tracking two torrents. And they both start with the same prefix because they're near my own ID. Now, to actually do a lookup in this table, whoa! To actually do a lookup in this table, we have to do a bit of, uh, of we have to have an algorithm. So, we pick the k closest nodes to the key that we're looking for, and so we have our table, right? And we know about some peers. In some areas, we have a lot of knowledge. It's really dense. Some areas, it's not very dense. Whatever. We just pick the k closest that we know about, and we send those people a lookup message. If they return, uh, if, if, if they're not actually responsible for tracking the key that we asked them about, then they'll say, sorry, I can't actually tell you 
the, uh, you know, any peers for this torrent. But what I can do for you is I can tell you about nodes that I know that are closer to the, the key that you're looking for than me. And so they'll tell me, hey, you should try talking to these guys. They're actually closer. And so then when I get those back, I'll actually send lookup messages to those people and I'll continue recursing. Eventually, I will get to someone who can actually give me peers. They can say, hey, these are the IP addresses and ports for the guys you're trying to look for. Um, and that means that, th that I actually found the peers that are the trackers for this torrent. And then at that point, I'm done and I can connect to those peers. Awesome. Cool. So this all works and it's efficient because the nodes are dense around, um, have, have, have a dense number of peers around their own ID. So as I kind of recurse over this algorithm, I'm kind of honing in very quickly on exactly the people I'm trying to talk to and it has really good performance. It's like I said, O of log n and over time, your table will fill up with stable long running nodes. And obviously there's one thing we didn't talk about, which is how do you, how do you get your first peer? Like if all you have is the hash of a torrent, you need to, how do you, how do you find the first one to talk to? And for that we need to find, we need to um, use uh, a bootstrap server, which is again, a point of centralization. There's always, <laughs> you're always going to have something somewhere, but we've minimized it so much to the point where as long as you know someone's IP and port, that's it. You're, you're, you're bootstrapped into the network and you can discover everything you need from there on out. Um, and so in practice, so this is what a magnet link looks like. Um, and it's just, it says magnet, it says uh, URN, which means uniform resource name, and then BTIH is BitTorrent info hash, and then it has the hash. Um, and that's it. But uh, you can also add a little bit more data in there if you want to be friendlier to the person's BitTorrent client. So one prem that you often see is DN, which is display name, which means, you know, um, uh, show this name in the, in the, in the interface. Now, uh, the reason why you need to do this is because, so remember the torrent file we talked about before, how it had a name field? Well, with uh, magnet links, you don't have a name field, right? You just have the, the hash of it. And it's, there's going to be maybe a minute where you're going out into the network and you're asking people, hey, can you send me the torrent file for this? I only know the info hash, but I don't have the torrent file. I don't know the list of pieces. I don't know the name. Uh, I don't know anything about it. I just know it's hash. So please give me that metadata. And during that time, your client won't even be able to tell you what the name of the thing you're downloading is. So when you add the DN parameter, it'll show that up in the client, which is pretty cool. And you can even add tracker servers in here if you want to get peers even faster. Um, so they're not kind of an either or thing. So cool, so this is where we're at. We have, we've managed to decentralize the finding peers part, but the search is still not decentralized. This is an unsolved problem as far as I, I know. Uh, I know there are some people who are attempting to solve this, but I've never seen it really done well, and it's certainly not a mainstream thing in the BitTorrent community. Cool. <laughs> so um, thank you for, for um, uh, in, indulging me in the DHT stuff. <laughs> Now I should get back to talking about WebTorrent, which is uh, why I was invited to speak here. Um, so, so what is WebTorrent? So, you know, we I've talked a little bit about kind of how the protocol has evolved, where we've we've eliminated these points of centralization uh, in, in in finding peers. Um, but I think the next evolution of BitTorrent needs to be making it easier for normal people to use. So I want it to be as easy as going to YouTube and watching a video. <laughs> yeah, I think we should watch that again. It's definitely worth another rewatch. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, um, I, want, I want BitTorrent to be something that's as easy as going to a website and, uh, and you know, and, 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 and pushing play on, on a video and just having it play right away. Um, and we're a long way off from that. So currently, you know, the best, uh, best you know, the, the, the experience is you need to go somewhere, download a torrent client, install it on your machine. Then you need to like go find a search site, search for what you want. And then you need to like get a weird, you know, file, download it, and then like open it up in this program. Then it asks you some questions, where do you want to save it? And then you wait an hour. And then you finally can like go find it on your file system and open it up in, in a media player or whatever. Um, it's not very friendly. So with, with WebRTC, a new uh, a, a protocol for uh, the web, um, we can actually do this. So what is WebRTC? Let's talk about what, how WebRTC enables this. So Justin Uberti, this uh, Google engineer, um, 
talked to Google I.O. and he described WebRTC as a project to bring real-time communication to the open web platform. So what this means is you can do peer-to-peer -peer video, audio, and data in a browser without any installation. So this is part of the, of the web platform. It's currently built into Chrome, Firefox, and Opera, including all of their mobile versions uh, on, on Android. So, um, so Chrome, Firefox, Opera, including all of the mobile versions on Android. Um, so this means that there's like billions of devices today that already support WebRTC, which is really cool. Um, but what about IE? So IE has this really cool status page nowadays. You can go to status.modern.ie and see what uh, Microsoft is working on and what they think of all the various specs. And recently they announced that they plan to implement WebRTC, which is awesome. Um, but the version of the API that they're implementing is kind of like WebRTC 1.1, and they're just going to skip over 1.0 completely. Um, and so uh, it remains to be seen kind of how easy the two APIs are going to be to, to uh, shim out, but it's going to be possible to make this work in IE as well, which is awesome. Um, Apple hasn't said anything yet about what they think of WebRTC. So, Common uh, things that you'll, you'll see WebRTC being used for are things like uh, video chat demos, um, where people will basically implement Skype in the browser. And that's pretty cool. But what I'm more interested in is being able to just send arbitrary data to, you know, between browsers and, that, and, 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 and implementing the BitTorn protocol using that. So I don't want to just, like, you know, ask the user to turn on their webcam and and use their mic and then like do a, a voice chat. I want to be able to send whatever data I want to send between browsers and do it without going through a central server. Because with that, I can build BitTorrent. So the way this is going to work is, so we have all these BitTorrent clients that are out there today in the world that are installed on people's computers, and they speak the BitTorrent protocol to each other. And this protocol you know, is, is, has a lot of uh, variations, but in, 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 in general, like the way to think of it is, it uses TCP and it uses UDP. To, um, you know, to, to, to talk to other clients. And this doesn't work in the browser, obviously, because of security reasons. Um, so WebRTC kind of mandates a different um, model uh, where, I'll get into it in a, uh, in a, in a bit, but it's, it's, it's a more complicated connection setup process um, that ensures that, uh, you know, that, that the browser you're talking to really wants to receive a connection from you. And because it's so different, you know, there's really no way to actually get um, a a browser BitTorrent client to talk directly to a normal desktop BitTorrent client, unless that desktop client does a little bit of, of extra work to talk to the web peers. And so the plan to roll this out is to build hybrid clients. So hybrid clients are going to be desktop BitTorrent clients that people will install that can talk the BitTorrent protocol. But also, we have these other clients, which are web browsers that only speak WebTorrent. And so you know, they're running in a browser. They're just literally a JavaScript script tag on a page somewhere. And they're talking to each other, sharing files amongst themselves. And they can also talk to the hybrid clients, because the hybrid clients can talk to both. So when a hybrid client is downloading a file and then be becomes a seeder, they're seeding it to both networks, both normal BitTorrent network and the web network. And I'm hoping over time that there'll be a lot of hybrid clients and everyone will want to implement this. But to start with, uh, you know, I wrote the first hybrid client. So just to emphasize, you know, this is not possible. You can't, you can't make WebRTC work with TCP and UDP without building some kind of centralized intermediary, and we don't want to do that. So these hybrid nodes are really important because they, they actually bring content into the web network. Without them, uh, the web, you know, the, the, these web peers are kind of ephemeral. They kind of show up and disappear very quickly because they're, you know, they're in a browser tab. When the user closes the tab, suddenly that cedar goes away. So the hybrid clients are really important. So um, I want to show you guys what it would look like to actually use the WebTorrent API to actually build an application, just so you can kind of get an idea for like how, how easy it is to actually work with. So I've built um, a node module called WebTorrent. You can use it in Node and in the browser, and it's the same module in both places, which is super cool. So when you require it in Node, you get a BitTorrent client 
that you can just use to download whatever you want. And if you require it in the browser, um, you use something like Browserify to build it, then you're going to get a, a client that is almost exactly the same code, except for it uses WebRTC to talk to other peers, and it can only talk to other web nodes. Um, and let's see how that works. So, uh, cool. So I have uh, some code here. Uh, here we go. Cool. So what we're going to build is a file sharing app where I can uh, drop a file on my browser, and then the browser will create a torrent and will give me uh, the info hash of it. And then I can just send that to my friend, and they can go to the same site and type it in, and then they're going to connect to the web, web torrent network, and they're going to find that user's browser, and then they're going to pull the file directly from them. And then they're going to become a seeder. And then a third browser could come along, and then they would be able to download from both of those existing browsers. So this is like the full BitTorrent protocol, but just over WebRTC. So let's do this. So to start with, we're going to require a module called drag drop. And this just lets us uh, you know, uh, uh, support drag and, the drag and drop API with a really nice API. Um, so I'm going to require uh, drag drop slash buffer. And what that means is um, once the user drops a file in the browser, I want to actually get the file back as a node style buffer rather than the browser's really weird uh, blob API, which I don't like. Um, so I'm just going to say when the user drops something on the body, please give me uh, you know, a, a call this function with an array of uh, files that they dropped. Next, we're going to require a webtorrent. And we're just going to um, create a new client. And when the user does the drop, we're going to call client.seed with the files that the user dropped. So we will become the first seeder for this content. And this is going to go ahead and create a torrent file. And then it's going to call on torrent once it's done that. And it's going to pass us the, that object. And we're just going to just log that to the page and say, yeah, we have a torrent. This is its info hash. Cool. Next, let's create a form on the page so that we can, so that the user can paste in an, an info hash and then they can download it. So we're going to create uh, an event listener here. And when the user submits the form, we will uh, call client.download and pass in the info hash. And what you'll see me doing here is, um, in addition to just passing in the, uh, the, the uh, hash of the torrent, I'm also saying, please use this tracker server here that, is, uh, that I set up. And um, you know, the, 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 the reason why we're doing this is because currently, we actually uh, haven't implemented a DHT that works over WebRTC. So we have trackers. So um, we're saying, please use this tracker here. And you'll notice it's using the WebSocket protocol um, because that's a, a more kind of web-friendly uh, way to do uh, a tracker server. And also, with WebRTC, we need the ability to push data to peers. Um, and I'll talk about that in a sec. Anyway, so then, um, again, uh, OnTorrent will be called once this user, uh, once this user has, has, has uh, found the, the metadata for the torrent that they want to download. So here's the seeding code, and here's the uh, downloading code. It's really simple. Just client.seed and client.download. Next, we're just going to iterate over the files that are in the torrent. And we're going to um, get each of the files and create a stream. So a stream in Node you know, is just a, a way to like, get the data out of a file sequentially. And we do this to get the actual content because we want to show it on the page. So the way we're going to show it is we call um, create read stream, and then we pipe that into the concat stream module. So concat stream is just required up here. And that will um, kind of collect all of the data that's coming out of the file and give it to us as a buffer. And once we have that, we're going to just insert it into the page by creating a link and um, using the create object URL browser uh, API to take a, you know, a buffer of data and to turn it into something that we can link to from the page. And then we just insert it into the page. And that's it. Um, and you can see the HTML for the page is right here. It's pretty straightforward. So let's see what that looks like. So here's a site that's live right now that you can actually go to and you, and you can test out WebTorrent. So you just go to instant.io. And um, we just drag a file onto the page to become the first seeder. So I'm going to go to my desktop here, and I'm going to grab this cute cat. 
drop it onto the page. So now it's saying, hey, you're the first uh, seeder, and I can click this, this to confirm that you know, the file is being correctly um, parsed by the page. Awesome. Now I'm going to take this info hash. I'm going to open another tab. And I'm going to paste it in here. I'm also going to just open up this inspector so you can see what's going on. And when I click download, it's going to find the peer from the other server and then download it. You can see it got the file here. This was done peer to peer directly you know, from one browser tab to another. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that I added to this that's super cool is you can, um, you can actually stream video data. So you don't have to wait for the file to be fully completed before you can start watching. And um, you can do this with the video tag. They're using this thing called the media source API. So the way it works is you can get video data and you can just shove it into the video tag as you get it and say, play this, play this, play this. And, and the video could be really long and you, it'll start to play back immediately. And to do this, you know, the client has to be smart about the pieces that it asks for from the network. It has to request them in order instead of requesting rarest first, like I talked about before. Um, but you can see this in action too. It's pretty cool. So I'm going to um, do this again, but this time I'm going to um, include a, a video file here. OK, cool. Uh, <laughs> All right, yeah, so I don't have sound, but that's okay because it's playing really loud dubstep right now. You don't want to hear it. Um, all right, now I'm going to grab the hash. I'm going to go to new tab and I'm going to paste it in. And what you're going to notice is pay attention to the, the loading bar on the video. You'll notice that it's playing back before it's fully downloaded the file. So it's streaming it in. And you'll notice that it's continuing to download data here. So that's pretty cool. So there's a little bit of extra code to do that um, that I'm not uh, that I didn't show you guys, but it's it's pretty straightforward. You just do um, when you do pipe, you just pipe to the video tag instead of piping to the uh, concat module. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so. So yeah, that's instant.io. One other thing you can do with WebTorrent that's pretty cool is, um, like I said, it works in Node. And in Node, um, there's a command line um, a program that you get when you install it. And it's called WebTorrent. So you just do npm install webtorrent-g for global. And then you can um, actually uh, use WebTorrent uh, as a, a console program. And so what I'm going to show you guys here is one cool thing we can do. So I'm going to invoke WebTorrent. Uh, where's my mouse? There we go. Okay. So, all right, so I'm going to invoke, ah, oh, geez, one second, what happened? Okay, all right, <laughs> so I'm going to call webtorrent, pass in a torrent file, and then I'm going to, I'm going to um, add uh, dash dash VLC, which means uh, please stream this into VLC as you get the data. So when I run this, uh, so uh, <laughs> this is funny because um, I, I asked Fred, to, uh, who's, who's the guy who is making the Wi-Fi work awesome, to give me privilege to use BitTorrent because uh, it was blocked before. Yeah. He also gave me one third of the capacity of the whole Wi-Fi network for this. <laughs> um, but it's still, it's still a bit slow for some reason on this network, and I'm not sure why. But um, if we give it a moment, it will eventually find some peers, and then it will um, stream the video into, into VLC. I'll leave that going for a sec. All right, if it hits one minute, then we'll, we'll move on. Oh, there we go. Found some peers. Awesome. OK. Now, where's VLC? Here it is. So what this is doing is it's actually created an HTTP server, and then it told VLC to play video from that HTTP server. And as VLC makes range requests for video data, the BitTorrent client watches the HTTP server, and it sees, oh, they want this particular bit of the file, so we're going to go get it from the network. Um, and Anyway, so that's, that's oh yeah, it's uh, some encoding artifacts. Anyway, it's streaming it, and if I were to seek to, that would work as well. It would just suddenly realize I'm asking for a different part of the file, and it would go and get it. It's really cool. 
It also supports a dash dash like AirPlay flag and Chromecast if you want to stream to a Chromecast. There's lots of cool things um, like that. So last thing I want to tell you guys is a little bit about how um, we get the same code to work in Node in the browser. So um, this is kind of what the dependency tree of modules looks like for WebTorrent. And there's three modules in particular that we need to change to work in the browser because, like I said, WebRTC is a bit different than uh, TCP and UDP. And the way we do this is we substitute these modules out using the browser field, which was actually mentioned in a talk yesterday uh, about Browserify. And um, what we do here is we say, when this module is being bundled for the browser, please replace these modules with these alternatives. In the case of uh, the DHT one, we put false because that's actually not been implemented yet for the browser. So we just say ignore that. Please don't even include that. But for tracker and swarm, we're actually going to get, uh, talk to you know talk to a different tracker, and we're going to handle the peers a bit differently. So remember, TCP and UDP is really simple, just an IP and a port. But WebRTC, I don't have time to go into this, but I just want to show you a little bit about what the flow looks like to do a WebRTC connection. It's insane. Um, this is. I kid you not, you have to do all these API calls in the right order and listen to all these events to make a connection happen correctly. It's insane. So um, we actually, I encapsulated this into a really nice module called Simple Peer. And anyway, so this is, this is what we do differently for the browser. And that's handled by that browser field. OK, so anyway, um, I want you guys to go out there and build applications using WebTorrent um, and um, like you know, find bugs in it because it's, it's, it's really new, um, but I think it's really exciting and I think it points us to a, a future where all applications will be peer-to-peer -peer and where, you know, we can bring the internet back to uh, this place where things are decentralized and, and, and there's not this kind of, like, corporate ownership over this, you know, infrastructure that's so essential to human freedom and to, like, good things in the world. Yay. <laughs> so, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Please make sure you ask at least one DHT question to Faroz later on when you grab him. Thank you, Faroz. Thank, Thank you, you so much for really waking us up and showing us the wild, wild web and torrent. Thank you. Next up, we have... Me. Yes. Hello. I'm here in the back. Thanks. Uh, so I have to shamelessly plug something after his talk about WebRTC. Uh, he has a really cool company in Singapore called Timasys. They're one of the sponsors as well, and they build the free Internet Explorer and Safari plugins for, for WebRTC so that these things actually work in the browser too. Um, as you can see, I'm using Safari here. This is Safari, and it's working with WebRTC. And to show you, uh, if you go to this address here, getaroom.io slash devfest, and your Chrome browser or your Firefox, or if you have the plugin installed even in Safari or Internet Explorer, the first two people uh, that go on that will be able to show up on that screen there. Um, so let's see. Oh, we have one. Who is it? Two? There we go. You're the two lucky ones. Roman, hi. Good to see you. Uh, so that's working. Uh, this is like how WebRTC can work. It, like this is the Skype as a feature part that uh, Feroz talked about. And if you want to explore these kind of things and build something yourself with it, embed it into your website or app or application, uh, please go to this website, uh, which is uh, the open source website from Temasys here in Singapore. And the platform is called Skylink. It's all open source. Uh, you can embed it into the app. Even the source code of this Get a Room demo is built with React, and it's free. You just click here, fork me on GitHub, and you get the code. Uh, so play around with it. Uh, the two developers of Skylink.js are here as well, Let and Tan. You may stand up over there on the right side, if you like. Like, you can ask questions. Don't be shy. There we go. Um, so yeah, check it out, play around with it. Uh, it's pretty powerful. It does the data channel and everything as well.